right, welcome to the Agora Podcast. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your usual host, Penguin. I'm joined by my co-host, Zach Agora. This is your home for agorism, localism, radical decentralization, and anti-authoritarian concepts. So today we have a special guest that's returning for his uh, second appearance here on the uh, Agora Podcast, or possibly his third, because we actually had a crossover episode as well. So I'm um, definitely looking forward to this one. Sec, why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest and uh, topic for today? Well, today we're bringing back Shane from the Vanu Podcast and Liberty Under Attack Publications. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, Vanu Fest and um, Urban uh, Urban Vanu. Uh, Shane, welcome back to the show, bud. Hey, I, uh, it's it's great to be back. I appreciate the invitation. It's uh, always great to chat with you guys. And uh, again, as I said in the last podcast, I've, I've, I'm always I'm very happy to see another I guess solutions oriented podcast out there. So another uh, another cheers on that one. Well, thanks, man. Um, so you got uh, um, let's let's get announcements out of the way. You got Vanu Fest coming up. What what's uh, why don't you tell them about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess to, to, to preface it, um, last year, uh, last uh, yeah, last May, I um, I guess yeah, last la end of last year, I uh, declared my twenty two acre homestead, the Free Republic of Pasnia, and uh, scheduled an event called Vanu Fest um, last year. And uh, basically, Vani Fest uh, this year—it's Vani Fest too. It's a full week of liberation um, here at the here at Veritas Pasnia uh, from September 27th to October 4th. And uh, essentially, uh, it's it's uh, um, it's as we're trying to do with Pasnia. Um, we're we're trying to bring uh, you know the the most committed self liberators, the most principled people who are you know um, who have forsworn the use of coercion, uh, bring bring us together to uh, you know enjoy uh, enjoy uh, um, yeah, enjoy a, a, a fun gathering in the wilderness, but also um, also self liberational stuff as well, because um, you know, well, you know, having fun is uh, is great and all. Um, it's uh, very important, especially in these times, uh, to work on self sufficiency and uh, you know practical skills um, outside of the first realm, outside of the survival society. So um, we don't have, uh, um, like I said, September twenty seventh um, to October fourth is the are the dates, and um, we don't we don't really have a rigorous schedule, but there are going to be a number of things that uh, we're going to try to do at, at some point uh, throughout. Um, we'll definitely do for some of them. But uh, um, we'll probably be processing a lamb um, or some uh, some birds, chickens and ducks, probably um, some fall gardening, uh, harvesting uh, type stuff, uh, canning, possibly uh, mushroom hunting. Uh, yeah, just depending upon um, depending upon what's up, what's up around that time. But uh, that's something I've been getting, getting into as of late is uh, going out and mushroom hunting. And it's crazy how easy it is. Uh, I didn't realize uh, how easy it was. Um, never spent more than like 30 minutes and I always come back with a big, big bag or two full of, uh, full of mushrooms to dry. So, or to eat fresh, of course. But um, yeah, so lots of, uh, lots of food self-sufficiency items. Um, we'll also be doing a um, Pat Henry, a pseudonymous individual, obviously will be doing a, a handgun training course um, there someday, probably Saturday morning, I'd presume. Um, and then, uh, I guess, uh, as part of our Pasnia Department of, Department of Health and Wellness, um, there's, we, there might be some possible experimentation with uh, electric uh, magnetic healing devices, ones I've got to test out and use myself um, on a recent trip, and uh, maybe possibly even the uh, acquisition of an important piece of equipment uh, in that realm. But I'm not going to disclose too much on that until it actually happens. Um, and I'm pretty confident it will, but uh, obviously, you know, things things happen. Um, I guess the, the, the note I will make is now that I've advertise some really cool stuff uh, about uh, you know an event here at the Free Republic of Pasnia. I do have to let's, uh, just let's uh, your audience know that only vetted self-liberators were permitted entry. So it's not a, a public event per se. We do, uh, we do want to ensure um, that uh, these free zones can continue on into the future. And um, obviously this is the uh, Veritas here is uh, the, I guess the flagship, you could call it the first uh, uh, demonstration of what, what, I, what I hope to see as, as an overall Pasnia network, an overall Second Realm network, um, not only uh, you know uh, um, trading, um, not only trading, but incorporating all aspects of uh, of our lives um, into the Second Realm onto a uh, foundation of peace and voluntarism. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's a little bit about Vanu Fest. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be a great time. Last year, I think about about thirty people showed up in total, and uh, this year um, there's probably gonna be uh, probably gonna be some more. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to it, uh, especially you know week long events. Um, uh, here, I don't got to go anywhere. People are coming to me. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, a little on Vani Fest and, and, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, some of your, some of the folks in your audience can get vetted and, and come out. Certainly love to have them. 
Groovy. Okay, that sounds really cool. And I see why you'd want to have everyone vetted, considering you're having it at your uh, at your locale, place where you you live, your homestead, mm -hmm. and everything. That's pretty cool. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, that's that sounds yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Um, I got a question about the uh, mushrooms. Um, mm -hmm. So about how many mushrooms do you haul? And is it just a matter of? I'm guessing from the way you described it, it's just a matter of like knowing where to look, pretty much. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I go back to the same couple of places, um, and uh, one of them is really, really, was really ripe with chanterelles for, uh, on a few different occasions over the course of a couple months. Um, me, me and Aura went out there for like 15 minutes and came out with two bags, full. like, I don't know what the weight is, but a lot of mushrooms. Um, a lot of mushrooms. Uh, and uh, just, uh, I guess, as, as of late, found another spot. And uh, um, so there's a, a really popular mushroom called Hint of the Woods. Um, well, that's a September mushroom. That's those those come up around uh, around this time. Well, there's an August version of that called a black staining polypore, and uh, we found like I mean I I I don't even know like each one of them weighs like five or six pounds, and we've gotten out and you know gotten five or six of those big ones. So it's uh, we've got a, a shit ton of dried. Um, I guess they're they're basically hen of the woods, just the August variety of them. Um, so it's yeah it's 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 crazy uh, knowing the place to look and really I mean if you just look around you're gonna find mushrooms. Um, now, can you identify all of them that you can eat? Um, probably not. I only know a few, but um, you know, you just learn one every once in a while, and you know, you, you'll eventually have a pretty good handle on it. So, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Knowing where to look and just just look for them. The mushrooms are out there, especially after a day or two after. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a small amount of a relatively small amount of knowledge. And um, a little bit of experience would, could go, goes a long way because if you're only spending 15 to 30 minutes and yeah, you're out in a place, I mean, you're out kind of, you're outside the city, you're in a rural location where you can readily access that. But I mean, that's not a lot of time if you're, if you're really getting all your mushrooms and a variety of mushrooms. I think that's uh, actually really cool. I haven't heard anybody mention yeah, and, um, mushroom hunting for. And, there's, and that's, that's not it, though. There's a couple other really incredible benefits to, to this. I guess I, I haven't mentioned turkey tail. They're everywhere, too. They just grow on logs. But uh, turkey tail is a, you know, a so-called cancer cure. Like that's a turkey tea, turkey tail tea. Um, so that you can find anywhere. We just, we, we, we found a couple of logs in the woods, took them back to the house, brought them back here to the house and you just kind of water it and you just have turkey tail growing on that log and it'll grow for a couple of years. And, uh, or actually just ordered, um, some shiitake logs, some, uh, some shiitake inoculated logs, um, from, uh, from some website and it just got here a couple days ago. So we've got, um, we'll have shiitake mushrooms. Um, possibly in the, in the next month or two, or maybe next spring. We don't know exactly when they're gonna when they're gonna come up. Um, and then the other thing I'll mention is like a financial and financial independence route or entrepreneurial route. Um, we we go to this health food store an hour away, and uh, um, the chanterelle mushrooms. Um, that she she has them in little bags. They're like 0 .03 ounces. Um, or they're like it's it's a really small bag. Um, but at the at the rate they're like two hundred dollars a pound is what it says on the bag. Um, and for the for the hen of the woods, um, you're talking you know fifty sixty bucks. Uh, honey mushrooms, which I haven't been able to locate in the woods myself yet. Um, we thought we did, but it was actually turned out to be a poisonous one. So glad we didn't try that one. Um, but uh, you know honey mushrooms are like fifty sixty dollars a pound. Like it's crazy. Um, you know what these what these mushrooms go for, and it makes sense because uh, um, before I even got into the into the actual mushroom hunting and drawing. Um, I've been taking, uh, you know, I've been all about, um, I take a mushroom supplement from a, a company called, or I guess a, a homestead out, out, uh, Northern California called Alpha Vedic. I'm off grid homestead. And, uh, it's this really incredible mushroom supplement. I drink some mushroom tea and then now I started, I, I've found out that I can find four or five of these mushrooms, um, you know, in the woods right around me. So, um, it's really, really incredible. Um, I mean, it's, it's mushrooms and honey have been like two of the areas where, um, I mean, I've 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 gone gone really really far into, and also a, a lot of mushrooms are like a are a really really high source of vitamin D, so you can't really get that from other sources like from plants. So, um, not not easily. So it's 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 insane. Mushrooms and honey for sure. Yeah, there there's big money in those mushrooms, especially um, some of the more popular and uh, you know sort of uh, herbal medicine holistic um, varieties and. You could, like you said, and speaking of financial independence, you could make yourself a nice little side hustle just hunting mushrooms, mm -hmm. and and selling them. Um, right. Never mind the, you know, they're they're very tasty as well. But um, right, and and, and I mentioned that, that been... I mentioned the inoculated shiitake logs too. Like those, I don't I don't know how much those go for, but as far as like fresh culinary mushrooms, um, and you can just. 
Um, that you can obviously inoculate logs yourself, but we we've tried a couple times. It hasn't hasn't worked out. Um, but you, we, we I mean, she she found the shiitake log for like sixty or seventy bucks, and uh, um, yeah, the hundred percent guarantee that it, they're gonna they're gonna grow mushrooms. So like as as a route, and I I didn't know about this a year ago, but as a route towards financial independence, if anyone is looking to try to exit, um, exit the first realm, however, um. But like mushrooms are a very very good avenue. Um, I'm kind of blown away and kind of mad I didn't know about it earlier. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll take note of that for sure. I've tried growing mushrooms a number of times. I've never had good luck with it. Um, it, it seems to be very hard to replicate nature in, in yeah. such in such that way. Um, you know, if you're growing indoors and in substrate or something like that. Um, never had good luck with it, but. Um, you know, nature can do what we can't. So it, it seems almost easier just to hunt for them. Yeah. Rather than um, grow them. Yeah, that's true. That that's definitely true. But I, I guess the the other the other side the other side of that is you you can order. Um, or I guess. Hmm. Well, I guess it, yeah, you are. It's it, you are right that that nature nature obviously does it best. Um, but uh, and I guess another thing I'll mention about the shiitake logs is if you're going to order like spores to inoculate yourself, um, you're going to pay quite a bit for those anyway. Um, so yeah, I think the logs are. I mean, again, I didn't know about this um, for a couple of days ago, but for a few days ago. But um, yeah, the, the inoculated logs are, are a good good avenue too. And you could just spread those around the woods too and have nature take care of it for you as well. I guess. Um, so I don't know. Lots of opportunities. Now, when you say logs, like. What are we talking about here? Like, like, like a, uh, an actual, like, just a tree log, like a, a yeah, just a, a just a. Right. Just a I, what is it? I mean, it, like a, a firewood length log. Is that what they sent you, or is it like but, a, maybe maybe like I mean, a, come on, flatbed truck? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's it's it, it, it's like maybe 12, 12, 12, 16 inches. It's just it's just one you'd pick up and carry out of the woods. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's not anything crazy. Mm -hmm. No. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's, um, that's do you keep bees? You right. mentioned honey. Do you keep oh sorry. Do you do you keep bees? I I don't know if I ever asked you. <laughs> well, it's so uh like I said, I I consume a lot of honey as a so-called type 1 diabetic. I have low blood sugar sometimes and uh, I averted to honey for that a couple of years ago even before I um even before I was uh working in any, you know, sugar or anything. But uh, then, yeah, I started, I started looking into some of the, the medical benefits. I've been taking, a, a, I've been adding bee pollen to my, uh, my tea for a while. Um, there's, I think it's called propolis. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really incredible, um, and I guess there's a, there's a number of uh, amino acids that are found in some um, varieties of, of honey that are really, really nutritious, really beneficial. Um, so I've, I've been, been kind of going in that direction anyway, but, uh, we just recently, I guess within the past month or so got, uh, something called a flow hive. So it's, it's actual, just, it's, I guess it's a brooding box. Um, but it also has, and it's kind of, uh, it's kind of, a um, I don't know, old time beekeepers don't like them cause they think it's kind of lazy, but it's got like a, a tap on the front. So you can fill up like honey in a mason jar with a tap, um, without like disrupting the bees. So that's kind of a cool aspect, a, a cool part of it. But we just recently got that. I put it. I put most of it together um, before we went to the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest last month. Haven't gotten back to it, um, but I've got to stain it and add a, add a couple few few um, other items onto it. And uh, then we've got to get. Uh, we're going to um, plant a little garden area out there for the bees with clover um, and uh, some some other things too um, that will, will hopefully attract them before before the winter. Um, not sure if we'll, um, I mean, not sure if we'll be successful in, in uh, obtaining a, a bee colony before winter. Um, but even if we do, uh, I'm not sure if we'll be able to actually obtain any honey because if we want them to stay there, we have to leave them food over the winter. So, um, but yeah, we're, we're get we're working on that too. Um, that was kind of an unexpected venture this year. Um, wasn't, wasn't planning on it, but we consume so much honey, um, for all sorts of reasons and, uh, all sorts of things. And I mean, you can, you can sell it too. And I've, I've also thought about, uh, there's, there's this kind of honey, it's called Nanuka honey. I think it's the name of it, but, uh, it's really, really expensive honey. And we're thinking about, um, one of the problems with honeybees is that, uh, um, especially like areas or areas around here, um, the glyphosate can be a concern. It can find its way into the honey. So we're thinking about just grabbing, or I guess uh, not, not the expensive kind of, you know, the luxurious flow hives, but, uh, you know, maybe like three or four, just like low, like low tech brooding boxes and having a few like just placing those randomly throughout the woods so that'd be it there it'd, it'd be wild honey um it'd be you know unadult like i said it wouldn't wouldn't have you know any uh, it'd be as far away from any contaminants as possible 
So we're thinking about that too, is just putting them randomly through the woods and going and harvesting um, as often as we can or as often as, as, uh, as needed. So um, not yet, but uh, there's there's big plans for it. There's big plans for it. Um, and yeah, in terms of another route for financial independence, uh, yeah, that's that's potentially one too. Yeah, there's there's big money in honey as well, especially you know sort of homegrown local honey. Um, you know, it's it's all the rage right now for yeah, a lot. Yeah, of- I've got some. Yeah, I've got some in a mason jar. I, I need to actually dig into that. And actually, um, you know, it's this is such a random occurrence. I randomly found an unopened mason jar of um, some peach butter, and um, it's a you know fruit based uh, preserves, jams, and gel. And there's I know there's uh, you know like technical distinctions between those. Um, I, I'm I assume, and I know for a fact for you, that you do a lot of. Uh, preserving and i definitely have looked up the um the different stages and different things you can do to uh preserve and make use of your um your, your fruits and uh some uh, i guess vegetables um but yeah h- how much of that do you do and um you know i'm sure there's uh, can be some uh, money in that too especially when it's you know homegrown and uh you know kind of small farm and homestead grown yeah. So as far as preserving our canning, um, we, we've we've done just a little bit here. Not not too much. Uh, Aura did some. Uh, she made some pickles, which we have yet we have to try. Um, hopefully we, we might tonight. But uh, yeah, all, we, all we've done so far is pickles. She did a little, she did some. Um, I guess earlier on in her life, but I've never really done any canning or preserving. Um, yeah, I'd be I'd be curious. Sec, uh, we 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 have a, a blackberry forest too that we that I didn't realize was there until until this year. Um, and we've got a bunch of blackberries in the in the freezer. Do you have, uh, I guess, any tips on making jam for that? And if you've if you've ever done that before, I'll send you a recipe. Yeah, cool. Oh yeah, figured so. Yeah, we make a ton of ton of jellies over here. Yeah, I'll send you a recipe. Right on. Um, but yeah, there, you can make some really awesome uh, preserves. And um, well, you might not enjoy cobbler, but man, there's a blackberry cobbler recipe my lady makes that is unreal. Mm-hmm. So. Um, if you like sort of fruits and baked goods, it's it'll be right up your alley too. I'll send you a bunch of recipes. Well, right um, but yeah, go ahead. Oh, and also you can make a, I don't know if you drink it all, but you can make a really nice wine out of some blackberries too. But. Yeah, I'm I'm sure I'm sure you could. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely definitely sure you could. I'm and that might be an interesting. Um, I I don't I don't drink I drink don't drink myself anymore really. Even though I, I make a bunch of liquor every week at the at a distillery, um, I don't really drink anymore. But as far as you know, like some homemade blackberry wine with you know locally harvested blackberries, that sounds pretty pretty interesting try. So yeah, I might 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 do that. Yeah, it'd be tasty on a on a warm you know a warm day or something sitting out in your homestead with some homemade blackberry wine. That's pretty nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll also toss out there um, one of the things I one of the uses of the blackberries that I've I've been thinking about. I don't I don't remember what it's called. Oh, pemmican. That's what it's called. Pemmican. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Sec. But uh, it's basically uh, animal mm-hmm. fat and um, animal fat and dried fruits. And you make them into it looks like a like it kind of looks like a, a, a bar, like just a chocolate bar kind of, but not chocolate. Um, and uh, it it's it's it stays good for a long time. It's uh, really high and and really, you know it's got the fruit in it, so it's got high high amount of sugar, high fat, and uh, it's got protein in there so as far as like uh, sustaining um long-term sustaining storable food um there's really nothing of better quality so i i, I hope to in terms of preserving um that is one thing i'd like to do uh, i'd like to try at some point but um yeah that might be next year at this point yeah that stuff's really good for like backpacking and um you know a lot of the hardcore backpackers you uh, make yes yeah. that once you mention it that's exactly what i um what I've heard about it, it's like the original, the original Cliff Bar, and it's yeah, probably a lot probably, easier yeah. to make if you have the infrastructure. You know, if you have the infrastructure, if you're a homesteader, um, and it's, I guess it's like a solid type of preserve. So yeah, it's pretty cool, and um, I'm sure it can get you by. I'm sure it can get you by in the uh, winter months when you kind of need a sor- so high source of fat, protein, um, and the uh, preserved fruit also is a, probably a huge benefit for you, even if you're not like you know. You, trying to survive through winter, like your your survival is not even a question. Even if you're not doing like an extreme amount of hiking or anything, but just the amount of calories you burn to stay warm and, and to take care of the homestead and do stuff in the uh, the winter time, I can see you really wanting to keep your your uh, fat content up and getting a regular intake of uh, preserved fruits. Mm-hmm. A little added boost. Yeah. Oh yeah. So 
Shane, Shane, you and I have been talking a little bit about, um, so every conversation when it comes to self-liberation usually seems, at least in our circle, seems to trend towards uh, like a rural setting where you need to go out in the homestead. And, and even this conversation now, like that's how this, we're just talking about <laughs> things that pertain to a rural homestead setting. You know what I mean? So like the, it seems like the these conversations just naturally drift to that being the answer. The problem with that is, is like, 80% of people live in cities. So you and I have been talking about, well, what could, uh, what's a good strategy for somebody that lives in an urban environment. And I went back and I listened to your, uh, I think it was Vanu in cities. Everyone should go check that out. And, uh, you're, you're talking to your buddy, Kyle, I think it was. And then, um, the two of you have mentioned that, the problem with cities is um, the density in population. Now, I think I'm going to push back on that a little bit and say that that actually might be an advantage, not a detriment, a dense population. So let me give you an example of what I mean. I lived in like Southern California in the heart of right near LA, like city, densely packed. I lived there for a couple of years. Now, I was doing a lot of like gorilla gardening out there. And we we're setting up gorilla gardens for homeless folks and water collection and all sorts of random stuff. Completely illegal, but we we're doing it right out in the open. And I, we had cops drive by and look at us and didn't even pay us a second glance because the population was so dense that the cops had more they had other things to worry about rather than some knuckleheads putting a garden in and on a highway median, you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. but you go out to the, so that was, you know, the, the city so that they, they didn't pay any attention to me because, you know, they were drove, drove by us on the way to like four shootings that day or whatever. So, but you go out into the country and you got some, you know, yokel sheriff or whatever with nothing better to do but to screw with you. And there's only so many people in that County. And, um, you know, you're, it seems in some asp in some sense, it seems like almost you are more of a target in a rural setting from authorities simply just by numbers. Um, because like I said, there's less people uh, there and also the cops have less to do. Um, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So, um, yeah, yeah. So the high, the 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 high, the, uh, the the I guess the the smaller proportion of people in a smaller in a small rural town means that the probability of you being the one that's that's tor targeted by coercion is higher. Um, yeah, that's 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 definitely right. fair. That's definitely fair. I suppose my um, the way that I look at it is um, any any interaction you have with someone who has not forsworn the use of coercion is a potential liability, right? Whether we're talking private or public. Um, state or just a private individual. Sure. So, um, as far as uh, as far as like living in a city, like I, I I know I lived in Austin for a couple months. I lived in a smaller city for uh, for longer than that. I've lived in cities most of my life, and uh, especially when I've gotten this kind of awareness, I um uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Even if I haven't technically, even if I, I I guess even if I haven't technically come across co coercion for some reason, it's it's just like it's it's as I think this this might even be the the, the bigger pushback from 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 Kyle and I's perspective is basically that it's a city psychological pressures. Um, I I couldn't. Uh, I mean, sure. it's it's yeah. it's just the the probability, the chance. It's the chance is always there if you if you uh, breathe the wrong way or look at somebody the wrong way or in this society if you um, are just trying to breathe without something on your face. Um, like it's it's any interaction you have with a potential coercer is a, is is a potential is a potential liability. So. Um, the way that I see it, and obviously ge geography is, is crucially important because, um, yeah, in some rural towns, maybe you'd be way more vulnerable to coercion, um, than you were in some big city. But, um, in, in my particular instance, I mean, I, I, I don't really have, um, at least, at least around me, um, there are really, uh, um, I, I know my neighbors, so that's one thing. And, and, and I know, I, I know my neighbors, but, um, and they're not very close. But as far as potential interactions with coercers, it doesn't exist out here. Um, I think of I think a bludgie's been 
out here. I've, I've been coming here. My, my dad's on land in this area since like mid 1980s. And I think I've seen a cop out here once. And it was when, um, when a cop had to be on a property to, um, fill out a police report for stolen four wheelers. It's so, like that was the only time I've ever seen a bludgie out here as far as as far as coercion um, People have had houses broken into by people that were I guess meth heads essentially, but um, I mean like that's that's really that's really it um, Whereas in the city. I mean, I've I've had a lot of interaction. I've had a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of not not a lot necessarily But I've definitely had more interactions with coercers in the city So that'd be that would so that and and I guess I'll just go back to the city psychological pressures um, I just couldn't deal with it. I, I couldn't deal with it personally and uh, I think Kyle was, Kyle's perspective was kind of similar on that. Um, so that's why I choose, yeah. choose to be far out in the woods. You know, I, I think it, the comparison works better because when you're in a rural area, it's it's very low density. It's it's very low amount of cops. There's not that many, um, there's not much kind of, you know, plus you have the private drives and you have just quite a bit of actual separation from people. But I think where you would run into maybe some of the same issues that you're describing, Sec, is the small town, the rural town, the like uh, not even a s very small cities, small towns um, where you will have a local police department and you will have um, neighbors close by and you might have some real busybodies and you have, you'll have like a lot of the local folks the business people kind of being involved with the city government and stuff and i think they could really uh not have that same mind your business pr uh, mindset as the rural folks so mm -hmm. i can totally see you running into that sort of thing in, in a small town setting and which is kind of sad because i think there's a lot of really good potential in small towns i mean in general just uh just in the most general sense i think that small small cities large towns small to medium sized towns all of that i think uh just ignoring the homesteading aspect for a second there i think that culture is kind of diffusing and decentralizing and um because our technology technology reduces and reduces the need for a lot of the centralizing principles um so i long story short i think small towns are a much i have offer you a much higher quality of life than they would have before. And there's a lot of potential um, to kind of get out there, even if you're not prepared or that's not part of your goals to do the kind of, um, you know, rural kind of the agricultural homesteading aspect of it. Um, and plus you'll still be close to a lot of producers, um, to produce like that. But like the downside being, you know, you don't know what you're running into as far as the local government authorities and uh, kind of the good old boys network and the power structure you might not be able to see when you just for, first come into town. Yep. So, um, and then as a city dweller, I mean, it's not the biggest city, but uh, I never had the cops give you know give me a second look for anything i mean you know just walking down the street and this and that i mean they're out there there's a, a ton of them and so you still have a much higher probability if you're doing something that usually someone some busybody neighbor calls in and i think that's your biggest biggest threat in the city to be honest with you is it's not that the cops are gonna want to you know interrupt their shift just trying to go home and say what are you planning out there there but some busybody there's neighbors always call a call in there's to... always a call yeah <laughs> yep. yeah that's, that's it and and from listening to police scanners uh quite a bit uh, for a small period of time like i uh that's what i've heard a lot was that uh yeah, this was called in right so <laughs> yeah. so you you make you make you make a very good point and and uh i did an episode recently with a, a, a guy that goes by the pseudonym ubiquitous omen uh, you can find him in the, in the Telegram channel and, and also just on the website or on, on that on that episode. But um, he recounted uh, some some scenarios where he had you know some interactions with bludgies, and it was yeah because um, his neighbor called um, you know called him on him. So maybe maybe the maybe the way to shift this conversation then is not or maybe to shift perspective. Uh, and this just kind of came to mind when 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 it comes to volunteering in cities. Um, maybe the population density is an advantage, whereas you can blend in. Um, the cops see a thousand people that look just like you every day, or look close enough to you, or, or just or look, you know, as or you look just as inconspicuous enough that you blend in. Blend in. Um, maybe the maybe the maybe the I guess the focal point then is the private coercion. Um, not necessarily trying to make yourself invulnerable and vulnerable to the public coercers, but the or the, the public coercers, but the private individuals who are going to be the ones to. Um, 
to initiate that to initiate or I guess to initiate that call that leads to the coercion, if you know what I mean. So uh, so, possi- so possibly yes. um, so possibly not like yeah. Look at the gut. Look at the you know do your due diligence and uh, strategic relocation. And uh, you know, look at the the you know, look at the you know, look at the local government and and the bludgies and all that all that stuff. Sure, sure, definitely do. But maybe you think more about, um, you know, who you end up live, moving into next, moving in next to. And, and and a lot of some folks don't have a choice. Like there's not they don't have a choice at the at the moment. And this is where they are. So maybe this still isn't applicable applicable to everybody. But if you're trying to move to a city or, um, or you're trying to move to a different place in a city, um, to, to that might be more optimal. Maybe you focus more on the on the potential private coercion and the private individuals you'll be interfacing with, um, or surrounded by. Um, so yeah, maybe that's the better way to look at it. So let, let's delve into that a little bit more. Um, so, um, like you said, there's there might be somebody that lives in the cities who might agree with us um, on on many things, but for uh, being a victim of circumstance, you know, maybe they're living pay. T- paycheck to paycheck in some um, some city somewhere and they, they just don't have the option to move out into the homestead. What what would be some sort of uh, tactics that you might find valuable in uh, an urban setting, we'll say? Uh, well, what would Ray, I guess what would Rayo say about that? Yeah, so so I guess there, there were... Uh, there thing were, that comes to mind? Um, Sorry. Oh, you're, you're good. Um, specific things. I mean, Ray, Rayo mentioned some kind of out there, out there ideas back in the '60s, um, like uh, living in a ghetto, um, and uh, you know maybe moving with with homeless people um, to blend in. But as far as I guess more, I guess more what I think to be plausible strategies, um, I guess uh, yeah, that's a that's a that's a, a good question. Um, really, I mean, I think the the first thing that comes to mind, and and, and this is what I've been I've been talking about on, on the podcast for a while, is is really the the choke point for the for the first round for the survival society is is really at this point the the financial aspect, right? Um, is is you got to have you got to have money to live to, to survive, and and then you're you're gonna have, you're going to jump through hoops to ensure that 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 happens. Um, so yeah, the first thing is yeah, try to try to you know get get a side hustle started, um, and uh, uh, you know, like it, and, and hopefully already have hopefully already have, but um, really really strive towards maybe get some mushroom logs and start selling shiitake mushrooms. I don't know, um, but really make it make it. Thinking. To... Yeah, I was thinking the mushrooms might work in, in that kind of environment. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Put them in your closet yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's the biggest Even thing. Once, once, you, once yeah, or backyard. Yeah. Once, once you get, once you get some financial independence and some room to breathe, um, then these, these things that are coming down, whether it's the, you know, the, the so-called passports or, um, you know, the, the, the so-called mandates on the public businesses, the public businesses serving the public, um, those sorts of things won't affect you as much if, if you don't have to use their systems to, to survive. So, um, so yeah, you, you just, you throw the mushrooms in your closet in your backyard. You got some really incredible shiitake mushrooms, a good source of vitamin D, um, and other things. And, uh, you know, you can sell, you can, you can, uh, you can sell those to, to, to sustain yourself. And that would be a major, major first step. Um, because a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the coercion coming down the pipe today is, I guess, kind of more so kind of under the, the guise of, of, of so-called private coercion where it's businesses, um, you know, that are, that are, that are, I guess, other than the big federal one that recently came down, I suppose. Um, but regardless, um, a lot of this is, is you know, uh, being enforced by private businesses that are forcing their employees to do these things. So if you aren't reliant upon, upon that, that'd be a major, major first step. Um, and then beyond that, I mean, it's, it's really just, uh, um, you know, awareness, um, you know, having that awareness in the city of, of things that could, of all the potentials and, uh, um, you know, blend. Yeah. So we've talked about blending in as much as you possibly can. Um, I mean, it's, <clears throat> I don't know. I know much beyond that, but really it's, it's, it's a lot, a lot of the coercion now is, is coming from the financial angle. So, um, I think that's, and that's how we started season two back a few years, a few years ago is with financial independence. And I think that's ever more important now. Um, you got to decentralize your income, not just relying upon one source. Yeah, I, I could um, not accept, because that room I, uh, talks about it so much, the guerrilla gardening. Um, I have quite a bit of, I can make like a whole map, just plot out so many uh, spots of open land, empty lots in my area. And I live right in an urban area. And um, this, it's amazing how much there is and how, how 
actually I don't ever see any of those get developed. So, um, and people sometimes do make use of them. Most of the time they just sit there until the grass grows high enough, the city has to mow it as little as possible. And other than the fact that they, that they get mowed regularly, I think that those are rife to, I mean, it, it, look, it's not your property or your land where you can con control it. But I think if you, if you um, just can prevent uh, the plants from being uh, mowed down regularly, I, I know I would be in a position to do quite a bit of that kind of gardening um, in those areas. And that could, I mean, just as one person, I'm, um, I'm getting fresh fruits and uh, vegetables, berries, or and, and, and mushrooms. And I think even you could even find places where the mushrooms could be grown. If you can't replicate that indoors or you know in a, an area you inhabit, you could replicate that in some sort of kind of, um, especially in a wet, dank area. And I can imagine places just like that. So, um, you know, and you have that, and you have quite a bit, depending on the area, quite a bit of. Um, open and unused land that can be used uh, in that regards plus like little parks and stuff yeah don't anybody get me wrong i i hate the city i just <laughs> hate it the psychological pressures like you were talking about they hit me hard i am not i don't do well in this city it it eats away at my soul i can't but, do it either um right but i i have to uh mostly on behalf of others make some kind of, uh, you know, carve out some kind of ideas because I realize that there's a lot of people living in a city, in the cities and that there has to be something that they can do aside from like, well, you might, you might want to move out of the city, you know? So Penguin, that was a great idea. Gorilla gardening is a, a potential strategy for, um, for a lot of city dwellers. You know, if it's not empty lots, there's lots of parks that you could put a lot of edible plants in. I know I've done it. Um, if you want to ask me how, cause I'll show you exactly how to, and I'll tell you exactly how to do it. Um, not that I would ever suggest anybody do anything illegal, but, um, the other thing is, um, there is a, a bustling gray, uh, underground economy in a lot of cities and a lot of people are working under the table. And I think you're right. I think financial independence would be your first route. Um, but I think that's very easy. That's something that can be done in a city pretty easily. Um, you can have lots of different, um, you know, I always, I always get that picture in my head of the, the guy from the hood doing a, a hair cutting business out of his car. He just mm -hmm. drives from house to house to house, cuts people's hair. Awesome. I've seen him. Like, so, yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for sort of underground, um, entrepreneurial, uh, ventures in in the city just because you have a lot of people you got a lot of customer base um and that doesn't have to be you know black market it could be easily be gray market like you said growing mushrooms in your closet um there's a lot of uh, another thing that people could do is kind of um get to know your neighbors better um in your in your neighborhood and maybe start to put together some um community not services, but community activities with your neighbors, whether that's um, putting together a community garden or, um, you know, pr start producing uh, water collection and that sort of thing. Just developing re relationships with the people that are closest to you. Um, I think that would be a pretty easy thing to do. And that used to be very common in cities. Um, it's not so much anymore, but I think it would still be doable. If you know your neighbors and you're friendly with your neighbors, you know, you guys can kind of uh, watch out for each other and uh, maybe you can start, you know, uh, building up some self-reliance on sort of a community level um, and that sort of thing. Um, and no, I'm not going to mention the, the book that shall not be named, but um, I, I draw a lot. For <laughs> I'm thinking of community technology here where, he, you know, he had whole communities like producing their own fish in a, in a city with you know, it, it's uh, you're only limited to your imagination. But Carl Hess was um, in the city, was building like huge vats and producing fish in people's basement. You know what I mean? So like the possibilities are kind of endless. I think there's, um, I think there's a lot that can be done. I, I don't want to write off the city entirely. I think there's a lot that can be done. Um, and I've just I've named a few just kind of off the top of my head. Um, 
But like I said, the eighty percent of people live in cities. So I mean, if we're if we have, um, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of potential there that we haven't maybe we haven't thought of. You know. Yeah. So I, I'll I'll mention uh, someone brought it up in the Pasnia chat in the Pasnia chat again. Um, but uh, from the from the Crypto Agora's novella hashtag Agora, um, there was something in there called an, a no tell. And uh, if I recall correctly, and, I, and I'm pretty sure I do, but basically it's just this uh, this um, uh, this this hotel in a city, this motel in a city that there's no one manning it, and uh, uh, people you know you know use uh, you know smartphones to, to to log in, they pay with crypto, all that all that stuff, um, to to get into the rooms and to, to um, and, and all that. Well, um, I mean that that's that that is one option that needs to be fleshed out more, but um, that's uh, you know I, I don't know I, I think there's 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 something there possibly. Um, because, uh, yeah, I think there's something there. Um, the other thing that, that came to mind, uh, was something that Rayo brought up and it may not necessarily be a great idea, but I figure I'll mention it in passing. Some folks do really well at it and they enjoy it. Um, but then again, I've also heard people who have had, you know, their, their mean time to harassment, their, the amount of time, or I guess the frequency of interactions with coercers is actually pretty high. Um, but the van nomadism with city squat spots. Um, so that, I mean, that's another thing. Um, if, uh. Uh, if you bring down, you know, speaking in financial independence terms again, um, if you bring down, um, if you uh, bring down how much you need to live on, you don't need to make as much, and um, then it, uh, then I think the mobility helps you too. If you can always leave, um, but then again, a lot of people don't want to don't want to to, to have that uh, that don't want to do the, the mobile lifestyles. But I figure I'd mention it in passing because it was something that Rio talked about a lot um, back in the day. That might be a, a great. Um solution to a lot of the people that i was talking about before they're sort of stuck in the city living paycheck to paycheck everything's very expensive and, and that's and that is a, that's one of the cheapest to... ways yeah i mean and, and people are forced out into yes. their cars right so um i mean and and i mean you yeah, again the only limitations are, are your imagination um and and yeah it's it's some people don't some people don't like it and again sometimes the frequency of interaction with coursers is, is higher if again people call call the cops on you because you have a sketchy this so-called sketchy van and, and you know parked on the street or something like that but uh then again i've, I've also I've, people have had a lot of success with it so um i don't write that off either um i definitely don't just um it's it's as with anything the the, the more you do it the better you'll be at it and uh then again there's so much information out there on van nomadism and even even more from I guess uh, people who wouldn't be agorists or uh, or wouldn't be I guess where we are um, as far as we are um, they they still um, yeah it still still works still works for them and they they, they see a lot of advantage to it so um, yeah it's 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 an option that might even be a good yeah that's that almost sounds like a good starting point for somebody like I said who was in a very uh, tight spot financially even if you had to do it temporarily like if you yeah. are worried about coming tyranny. And you're you're concerned about the location you're in, but you're stuck due to finances. You know you're you don't you barely make enough to pay your bills. Everything's so expensive in the city. Um, go I mean, make the intentional choice to go live in your vehicle for a while. Move around as much as possible. Go listen to the the Vanu podcasts, and um, get you know then you can save a bunch of money because you know living in your car is costing you hardly anything at all in comparison to rent in a city um mm -hmm. and then you could stack a decent amount of um money to where you now you have more options of as w to what path you want to take after that so i think that's mm -hmm. a uh that's probably uh one of the better op solutions honestly um would be to go nomadic like, like yeah the, the cops are gonna hassle you i i think more than they would in other areas but um you know that's kind of the chance you have to take, and you maybe have to be a little smart about it. But mm -hmm. um, you will save. Uh, that that is the way out. That's an e it seems yeah, to be an easy yeah, way out. Yeah, if you're for looking, and that's who's yes. Stuck. Yeah, if if you're looking for your way at way out, whether it's out of the city or whether it's out of the first realm entirely, um, then I mean that's it's the that's the best. It's 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 one of the best transitionary lifestyles. Um, and as Rayo said, it's not a panacea. There are problems with it. Um, that's why he stopped. He's, he, the Van Nomadism was not enough freedom for him, so he went and lived in a tent in the middle, middle, middle of the Siskiyou National Forest. 
So, and Bella Coola, British Columbia traveled around, wasn't in one location, but, um, but yeah, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not the end all be all and you don't have to view it as that. But, um, yeah, as sex said, um, if you're paying a thousand dollars a month rent in the city and you've got a car you can go live in, and if you go live in that car for three months, you can stack, you know, five grand or something like that. I don't know. Like it might be worth, um, you know, it might be worth, uh, it might certainly be worth doing, um, especially with, with, with yeah, might, might be worth doing. I mean, if you could come up, come into it with a little bit of capital and, um, you know, you have to have a vehicle anyway, if the circumstances kind of align, I think getting a nondescript type of, you know, commercial style van, diesel, diesel, uh, van, or I might actually want a gas powered van in this case, but you know, just, you, just a white van that, that can, could be, it could be a plumber, electrician, any, any sort of, um, any sort of service, nondescript, uh, keep it, yeah, keep, you know, clean and in good order, mm -hmm. really try to basically keep it impeccable so you you draw as little it's the most common type of thing you see on the road you draw as, as little of attention to itself as it can and if you're able to blend in and you'd blend in so much easier in, in that urban setting where like for example a street over for me is a ton of different it's like a light industrial type of area although it's kind of turning into uh you know a microbrewery and little hip restaurants and stuff like that but um it's it's still like we're right uh, stone's throw from where I am is still very much, you know, mechanic shops and little lots where people have tractors and, and some vehicles, parks and stuff like that. I mean, very much light industrial. Like you could park a van up on any of these streets and it would be the most um, un, unremarkable thing. Uh, unremarkable thing. And then there's a, uh, you know, you got to have it insulated. You got to have a few technical things uh, worked out that I think, I think there's people that, that have, Kind of pioneered this that can pretty much trans you can get that knowledge transferred you pretty efficiently so you don't have to trial and error yourself um i i think that'd be the the route to go um you you want to basically blend a blend in as much as possible and b you know just have as many of the uh comforts for as, as little as uh you know little expenditure as possible little as little cash outflows as possible and you don't have the option of like living off of you, you don't have an option of producing much um so you're really trying to minimize your your cost there and uh really when you think about the the, the, the amount the way rents are going in the cities i mean when, you, when you're doing the numbers I, I think that that you can save quite a bit once it once you make that initial investment because rents are only going up and they are they are very very high in a lot of these places and they're only going up I know you said a thousand dollars a month. That's like cheap in a lot of cities. Like yeah. sixteen, eighteen, two grand a month for a crappy apartment in a lot of cities. I yeah, I think I, we're I on to something here. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I think we're on to something here. If you, I'm just kind of playing this out in my head, so if you could couple all of the things we said together, so you get out of your crappy apartment that you're paying too much for. You, die, um, you move into uh, a van like Penguin Sec, make, make it look like a work van, so you kind of blend into um, you're just any other plumber or electrician in the area. You diversify your income, and then you couple that with, um, you know, knowing some people in the area, maybe uh, doing some community gardening or that sort of thing, doing some gorilla gardening in the, in the forest, so you always have a source of food around. Uh, maybe you fig figure out some a place to hide some water collection and that sort of thing, just so you can, mm -hmm. you know, kind of have your food and water. And if you couple all these things together, it's kind of starting to come together for me to where this could be a really, you could be pretty well off um, by doing all of these things at once. You know, I could see this as almost like a lifestyle. And if you got a couple of, you know, underground um, um, side hustles or sources of income, um, that sort of thing, wh whatever that is. Uh, depends on whatever you're good at, but um, I, I could see this being uh, a reasonable strategy. We'll say, maybe not, still not as good as moving out to the country in the homestead, but much better than say living in an apartment and living paycheck to paycheck. So, I think we solved the problem here. 
<laughs> Sir, it's certain it's certainly a solution uh certainly a solution um right and, and i guess I'll, I'll even let's think bigger about it that's that's always been my biggest mistake before is not thinking bigger about it well um then uh you know con expand this out like yeah you know maybe maybe this you know having um uh, maybe some folks want to stay in the same city but then expand out to it to an entire network like pasnia and um then I, I mean and, and is that that is that is one of the one of the things i envision with the, the overarching network is is uh um no no uh, mobility and nomadism is a staple to vanu um it's it's a it's a it's a core part of vanu for for a lot of lifestyle changes um but with with uh with mobility i mean if you don't have 22 acres or you don't have a backyard or you don't have something well, if you don't have those things it's storage and also producing for yourself um you don't have any you don't have area to produce if you're you know living in a vehicle or um, you might not have uh, you, you, wouldn't, you don't have as much room to produce if you're living in a vehicle or if you're a pedestrian nomad or or, or whatever so um yeah it's uh yeah, having you know building up that uh, you know individual resilient lifestyle is great and expanding out to other folks um is is great but uh um you know i i think this could be it could definitely be bigger where um definitely definitely be bigger where it's not only um just one city but um travel nomads travel um and travel all over the world and uh they never have to step foot in the first realm if they don't want to um, and I think that's kind of the, the, the ultimate, the ultimate vision is, is, uh, we're, yeah, we don't, uh, you know, this, this conversation evolves in a couple of years to where we're, I, I don't know, but, uh, um, not that it hasn't, but, um, I, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's, that's where, where, where my thinking is at. I, th I think something, something, um, yeah, I, th I think a, a definitely a network like that would be valuable. Yeah. yeah there's I, no reason I, you can't, I was just going to quickly say, there's no reason why you can't network. Um, obviously, you can network with all sorts of people in the kind of uh, in counter economic settings or whatever when you're doing that uh, van lifestyle. But there's no reason why you couldn't have uh, multiple. And I know this actually does happen because there's there's parts of the country where there are, and I, I think a lot of that's climate based. But there's parts, there's places where people are doing a sort of variation of this kind of van and this, this nomadic lifestyle. Um, it's definitely something that's increasing, and I think that you can actually network with other nomads quite a bit. And with the kind of communication technology that we have, you can really make something out of that. So if you're able to coordinate with them, share tips and and hints about locations, and I mean, and honestly, nomadic people have been doing that since the beginning of time. Even mm -hmm. Hobos used to do that, like they had a way of communicating um, thanks to different different wanderers i mean um the signs and codes and everything but no any um you can actually have a network of people moving around place to place they can let each other know about different opportunities and places and then you're able to get up and move um and one thing i've, I've heard from like econ what economists apparently are saying and this is this is actually surprising is that uh the the labor mobility in the u.s is down i think there's something that's getting people a lot of people are having pr pretty tough times in the economy uh, these days and but when you look at it people are moving around less and actually less um for work and unfortunately it's kind of the nature of this country it's a big wide open place and and um there's going to be times where it might be very beneficial from you if you can't find an opportunity in one location to move on to the next and that goes for anybody not anybody interested just in the second realm and whatnot but i think that equally applies to um to that kind of thing as well and if if we can make that as easy as possible i think that's kind of the key for a lot of people that might be stuck in this kind of rut and might not have the resources to do go the full homestead route or just might not want to yeah i don't i don't know if it was um shane i don't know if it was the last time you were on that we talked about this but we talked about um mobility uh, one downside of mobility is you can't build up um, capital, and I mean capital in a number of different things. I, I mean resources, land, but I also mean it's harder to build up uh, human resources, like people um, develop, mm -hmm. you know, strong bonds with your neighbors and that sort of thing. But you, you just mentioned something about thinking big like that. So um, you really could, you, may, you might not have be able to build capital because you're in a van, right? So you might, you don't have the land but you could very easily sort of hop from place to place to place of people that do and trade what you have to offer for what they can produce from having that uh, 
those resources. So you mm -hmm. might have a valuable ser service that, or a set, or another good or service that you can trade for the benefits of them having that land, that that uh, human capital, that um, those resources, that sort of thing. So if you had a network of people, people who were stationary might find that very, very valuable, um, those, those people that are nomadic. So it might end up being a very big deal in the future, a very symbiotic relationship of people that are nomadic, don't have that, um, those resources, but they have a, essentially, instead of having a small knit community, they have a much broader uh, community spread throughout the entire country that they sort of travel to and from to as sort of like hubs, like to your house, to Pasnia, to my place down here, to over there in California, to the, you know what I mean? So you, mm -hmm. you can, they can benefit from us having that capital and we can benefit from their mobility. You see yes. What I'm saying? Yes. It, exactly. And and I will say, as um, one of the um, for for the free plug of Pasadena, one of the it's I guess the membership or cooperative thing that I that I do here. It's for for the founding stakeholders for you know the vetted individuals I've been going to the Modesto Peace Liberty Fest with for like six years. Um, one of the perks last year was ex exactly that that you know there are people that are nomadic or they don't have land, and uh, one of the perks was if you pay for the lamb and uh, chip in on food, I'll raise a lamb for you on the property. Come down here, we'll process it, and you can take the meat home with you. Um, and uh, I mean, I could like I, I could definitely see um, uh, we were raising raising some chickens here for for uh, for um, for uh, for another self liberator um, who yeah doesn't have doesn't have the space to, to raise any chickens at this point. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I certain yeah that's 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 exactly it. I mean, there's there's um, there's definitely ways, um, and it's 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 more of a necessity now. Like there's there's um, and it, it it works better if we work together. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely with you. Um, definitely with you. And that's, that's, uh, that is, uh, the bigger Pasnia vision for sure. The bigger Pasnia vision. And, uh, Rayo called this back in the 1960s. Uh, he wrote an article, um, called Smoomins the Super Hobos. Um, and, uh, and so that, that, uh, and Smoomins is seclusion and mobility using multiplicity. So, um, secluded, using seclusion and mobility as well as multiple Vani home bases. Um, was the, the idea behind that and um yeah that's that's the the Pasnia network is uh, definitely a definitely a possible vision of that the second realm network um again people who uh, you know traveling nomadic which uh, and and also i i want to uh, me and me and uh, my freemate have uh, we want to go live on a sailboat someday we want to we want to travel around and all that and obviously we want to have a network of, of second realm so we don't have to deal with that bullshit society right so um we're also building this up for ourselves so that we can go, you know, travel if we want to, when we want to. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's already happening. Um, it's already happening for sure. Yeah, and I like how that's is really not something that's totally new. That you know, Rayo wrote about it, and it is something that probably he encountered pretty fast, kind of networking with people and everything when he was living that lifestyle. Right. So I I was uh, gone, so I don't I didn't. I didn't catch what you guys were talking about, so you guys have to start it up again. All right. You hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I'm just got to, yeah, things, things, way to, we kind of, we kind of ended the topic about the, um, Smoomins. The, uh, Vin Amanda, Smoomins. Do you, do you know about Smoomins? No, I don't know what that is. What is that? <laughs> Well, it was a uh, it was a, an article Rayo wrote super back hobo? in back in Bonnie Life, but uh, Smoomins the super hobos uh, seclusion and mobility using multiplicity. So secl using seclusion of the wilderness and mobility, as well as multiple Vanu home bases for the ultimate um, Vanu lifestyle. So the only real difference between what he described, um, his article is very much more like, hey, we we have tents out here in the woods in the wilderness. Um, we all have a common meeting spot, but no one knows where any of the others are. Um, now that's obviously not word envisioned. This is kind of, uh, I guess, uh, a step beyond that, um, with you know the the second round network, the Pasnia network. But yeah, that was just something I wanted to, to drop in. That yeah, and as Penguin mentioned, it's not a new it's not a new concept. It's definitely not. Um, it's uh, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> well, I, I think with technology, I think we have a, we have ways to do this more cheaply, more efficiently, and. Um, to be able to do that more effectively, I guess you could say, than at any time before. I mean, the technology is there to give you way better uh, quality of life, ability to communicate 
in a uh, mobile sense. I mean, that's just, you, you can't even imagine just 50 years ago how much more difficult it would be compared to like nationwide 4G everywhere. You could do literally anything. Um, and then climate wise, I think you, you, you saw a, cli uh, a lot of this has always been climate um, dependent. It still is, you know, but this, you're not going to be able to do this very easily in even a, okay, you know, decently insulated van in um, the cold uh, winter, or you might not um, want to do it in, the, in a very hot, very humid region or whatever the thing might be, or obviously when, you know, hurricane season comes around and whatnot. Uh, and a lot of that can be answered by moving around. And I think that's what people that have lived a nomadic lifestyle have traditionally done. But I think Again, technology allow, gives us the ability to um, open more possibilities and maybe not have to follow some of those constraints as so much. And I guess I'm, I'm one of those, probably the biggest one I would say, going back to tech, communication, is the biggest constraint would be not being information. It's being cut off from information, being cut off from communicating with other people, networking. Um, and w w once you have the world's knowledge, essentially, and and the ability at your fingertips and the ability to communicate with whoever you like, um, audio, video, and, and however, I, I think it really opens up the possibilities for doing this to anyone who basically, you know, can live inside the, that, that size constraint. And frankly, I mean, depending on what city you're talking about, I mean, there are people living in some pretty tiny places based on their their financial constraints and they're paying a lot more in, in those places you're go i think i'm going back to carrier pigeon man i, I don't trust audio or visual communications at all but yeah well you're 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 in a, you're in a look you're in a single location honestly you you, you could do that we could do the podcast though <laughs> so something i was thinking about while you were just talking is i think i notice a deviation sort of from Rayo's ideas because we might have a slightly different goal. So Rayo and Vanu are, um, you're trying to eliminate coercion from your life, right? Mm -hmm. So, but this might be in contradiction to building a, a, a parallel society, we'll say, uh, a second realm or an agora or whatever, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. building a, a, a rival society to an existing system because that means we have to interact with other humans. We can't necessarily just go out into the woods and eliminate most of the coercion from, from our lives just by not interacting with people. We have to take on a certain amount of risk by interacting with other humans to build uh, alternative relationships and networks and services and goods and distribution production all those sorts of things so I'm no you're trying right. to think of where i was going with this but I'm, I'm, but I'm um, so i think right i think we're doing two things at once is that we are yes we're trying to liberate ourselves and trying to uh avoid coercion of you know the state but also uh private actors but we are also trying to build something new so that means we have to give up a little bit of our security, I guess, um, just so we could we can interact with other people who are on the same path, and that involves the potential for coercion. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So we're trying to. I think that going forward is trying to find that balance in between those two things. Because like, if if my only concern was um, removing coercion from my life and my family. You wouldn't. We wouldn't be having this yeah, conversation. Exactly. Right now. Yeah. Exactly. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. No. Like, I'm. I'm. I'm right. totally I would with be you. on my homestead. None of you would know my name. Yeah. Yeah. I've right. I've commented in the past. I guess I've come to the same realization. Um, I, I've commented maybe a couple times in the past privately that you know the Vanu podcast is at times anti Vanu now, um, which is kind of you know paradoxical in a way. But um, but then again, the way the way that I see it now, and it's the way that I explained it last year, is that. Um, yeah, you know, um, if, if it's, you could certainly go live in the wilderness and just, and, and be self-sufficient and, uh, you know, and be invulnerable to coercion, but you're missing out on a lot of, I guess, on a lot of the other components of life, I think, um, you're missing out on, on, on those. And, 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 uh, um, then I, I don't think it's necessarily sustainable either. Um, well, it's sustainable long, like it's sustainable long-term. Like if it's just you out in the wilderness and you die, then what's, that's it. Right. Um, 
so that, that that's that's definitely that's definitely true. Um, but at the same time, I, I still see it as a, as a venue in pursuit, though, because um, the point that society has progressed to, and, and this is this is what I think was the brilliance of Rayo back in the 1960s, is he recognized that Vanu was going to evolve to different times and to different situations and scenarios, and um, and now it seems like uh, at least my my perspective is that, um, <clears throat> yeah, I I I, I kind of. I, we do, we need to build this this uh, I mean the the network well there needs to be a lot of networking um, and there is a lot of networking but um, there needs to be a lot more integration um, and uh, in this pursuit of the, 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 okay so let me let me back up um, so there there has to be um, in order to and and the way society is now in order to um, to practice Vanu, to become more invulnerable to coercion. Um, to decentralize our to decentralize, you know, our our, um, our resources and things like that. Um, we kind of, yeah. This is this is. I think this is where Vanu is now. I guess is the rambling, um, you know, rambling aside. I think this is where Vanu is now. Is that um, some some risks need to be taken that maybe didn't need to be made 50 years ago, right? Um, and 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 I kind of see oh. just yeah. If 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 every if if the and I, there's also this this thing too. So you've got everyone in that society, or not everyone, but you've got all those folks in that society that are doing that are going along with this, and it's going like a, it's kind of a you know a choke neck on freedom, right? Like it's 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 not really going to exist much longer. And and uh, you know, New York City or Chicago or things like that. Maybe you know individuals who are very very good at Vanu, they'll they'll be okay maybe. But um, but generally speaking, um, there's not going to be any freedom. Uh, there's not going to be freedom for those folks. Um, and uh, for those for those individuals who go out in the wilderness by themselves and you know and, and do self sufficiency, that's great. But um, what what does that what, where does that leave for the future, right? So I, I think um, I think a little risk is ne risk is necessary and just kind of needed right now. Um, so I, I think yes, you're right in pointing out that um, I have had the thought you know the anti the Vani podcast is actually kind of anti Vani at times. Um, but I think it's I think it's the I think it's evolved to a point where it's kind of necessary. Yeah, um, I mean. I just want to say that the first thing I wanted to say is that that was kind of the, when, when I first encountered like libertarian off the grid types and different people that were into that kind of homesteading, um, the homesteading thing, or you know, just, just wanted to, or, or, or saw that as the, um, obvious solution. It's like, uh, yeah. And, and I think actually doing the, doing the homesteading and actually engaging in kind of, um, you know, a mixture of self-sufficiency and counter economy i think that's great but like just going off into the woods into a cabin just to get away from everything i mean of course that's to some extent if you can secure uh yourself from the you know most obvious coercion if you can you know ha have the money and the just just um do what you got to do legally to kind of get rid of any in, in a interaction with the outside then yeah okay you're you're, you're good i mean there's obviously might be a, a taxes you have to pay or something but whatever you got to do uh according to your discretion you can just completely isolate yourself wire yourself off that's fine you've you've achieved the goal of like minimizing possible uh coercion and then if you go into a tent in the woods obviously you don't have to worry about taxes or anything else i mean you're, you don't have to worry about anybody knowing where you are however you know those are all those i didn't think we discussed this in the first um appearance that you want shane um that's there's obviously a lot of drawbacks there's a lot of just trade-offs when it comes to doing that and that's maybe not the optimal point of trade-offs for most people you know and the second thing i wanted to say is that um i i don't think you said that von areo understood like i think a lot of good people that come up with a certain kind of philosophy that the vanu will have to adapt to different times different situations and i do think that's true and i think uh, we we have some pretty we have some challenges coming up in this time however just thinking back to the 60s and not so much like 68 and some some things that were going on then but just thinking about where, where society was at the time legally and uh politically and so um just social attitudes of, of the average person that you, you came around um, compared to now. And I think you've got a, and this isn't universally true, but I think you've got in many cases a more tolerant and honestly in a lot of ways uh, more um, freedom people that in certain ways 
and this might not be in the ways that a certain a person that prioritizes freedom but definitely like people that are more accustomed to ideas of individual freedom and uh you know a deference to their individual preferences and people going their own way definitely compared to like the early 60s i mean you're coming out of that's a very very conservative time in uh the country's history and i don't think we should uh, uh, underestimate the amount that uh society and attitudes have changed over the time even though we see um certain things now there's always a, a threat of uh major you know really obvious government overreach uh, if you look at like uh the way the economy and in, in travel and stuff was actually um regulated even if they might not have been as pervasive pol you know policing you find that the economy was extremely heavily regulated back then, even compared to now. And uh, at this point, regulations can't, because look who's, you know, runs these bloated bureaucracies, regulation can't even keep up with the pace of uh, technology coming out. I think you've got, if you know how to be selective and you know, if you know how to be selective, you know how to make the right kind of networks and i don't just mean networks of people that are you know conscious in, in of, of vanu or other like you know freedom prioritizing kind of counter economical um people uh um you know uh groups i think you can find a lot more societal tolerance in some circles for kind of the the ideas of, of vanu you can find communities of people that are a little bit more situated to to um work with than you might have been able to do in the 60s in the back of the 60s you might have perfectly perfectly conservative people that just like to mind their own business and want to trade you know you know um fresh apples for uh for a heater repair or something i mean just you've got you've got that too so you've got the conservative outlook and then you've got kind of the more um i don't mean this in a political sense but the more liberal kind of outlook because i think people are actually used to a lot more individual freedom in certain respects outside of the hot button things than you would have in rio's time yeah i kind of reject uh reject the the linear progression of, i totally do yeah uh, I mean, certain things are more free now than they were then, but certain things are more restricted than they were then. It's, it's not a, it's not a, um, a, a linear path forward. It's more like the uh, an evolving cycle. And I, I actually want to make a counter argument to the point I made earlier, and because I was thinking as you were talking, so um, you could go live in the middle of the woods off grid. And that would probably remove coercion, right? Until they find you. <laughs> We've seen this happen again and again. No, I'm not. It's not. It's not even a joke. I mean, look, think about that dude that got shot in a tent in what was it? And somewhere in California, he was crying for his father. Remember that a few years ago in Fullerton, there uh, in California, mm -hmm. you had Randy Weaver and his wife, the Ruby Ridge. Uh, you know, pick your. Pick your government uh, overreach and murder. So w the argument I'm making is it's you could make a pretty good case that forming an entirely separate society is uh, removing the ability coer uh, for coercion because now you have a network of people that you can hopefully rely on. You have a community. You have people that if you need to get gone from your place because – whoever is going to um, cause you problems at your home. If you have a network of people throughout the entire country that you know and know well and uh, have allowed in your, your life or even locally, whatever this case may be, that community can potentially be more beneficial uh, in terms of uh, preventing coercion than you living alone by yourself. And I just want to butt in. Um, if you're talking about a society like that, this where, where people are relying on each other, um, I mean, not just for mutual aid, but for, if, in terms of uh, of confidence and in terms of just wanting to see people um, succeed and do well and ex escape co escape coercion and um, 
you, you know, and we're talking about a situation where you have it's, it's sort of a separation situation of neighborliness, but not of people that are necessarily um, geogra in geographical proximity. I think looking at that from the ethical or, or, or moral uh, sense, it's um, it's a it's a kind of situation that promotes people, you know, generating goodwill and social capital and a good rep reputation. And I don't know, it, it kind of um, it gives us the opportunity to live I our think principles it would be now. A society of, yeah, it gives us our, it gives yeah, us our, it, it, our it, ethics and morals to exist now for us to actually live the way that we want to. Yeah, but it promotes it promotes ethical ways of living and dealing with people, and it kind of filters out people that aren't going to thrive in that kind of thing where you're relying on other people like that. And from what I understand, I mean, there are people in, in, in these sorts of uh, niches and communities that are very, very generous to people that have built that right level of goodwill. And I think in general, you'll find that people are pretty generous to those that are not necessarily strangers. Obviously, there's also a concept of generous, generosity to strangers mm -hmm. when they're here, they're in need. But people that have built just basic goodwills and, and bona fides and just people that they know they're legit, not a fed or what are just not a, a grifter, a scam artist. I, I think people are honestly quite generous in that situation, but it promotes that kind of um, ethical interactions between people, voluntary, peaceful, honest, you know, being honest, being trustworthy. And so it hopefully filters uh, not that we're filtered us uh, well filters out the, the bad and filters in or you know you know what i mean kind of arrogates people with a uh, good ethical foundation so i don't know it's kind of my first thought when i heard of that yeah yeah i'm i'm in i'm total agreement i'm liking the the development of I'm loving the development. And uh, just to, to go back again to, to mention Smoomin, seclusion, yeah, so seclusion and mobility secluded. using multiplicity. I don't think that's any different than what we're talking about here. Secluded areas away from the, away from the first realm, away from the servile society. Uh, mobility always being an option because you have this network of individuals, even if, you are, even if you're going to remain immobile until you, until you don't have to be. Um, and then using multiplicity, again, having, diff having these various nodes, these these uh, these like-minded areas, uh, you know, all over the world. So, um, yeah, I guess to, to kind of talk back uh, to um, bring that bring the discussion back around. Maybe uh, you know, maybe this isn't uh, actually as anti vanu as I thought. Um, just uh, it's just the uh, the newest development. I guess the maybe the the newest iteration or or uh, the the way that it needs to be. Yeah, going forward. A, I don't know. Yeah, it's just the evolution. I th I think it is completely in line if you think about it in the way that I described. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, and, I, and I, I only see that, I see that as the only option going forward anyway. I don't see, I, I, I don't see running for the hills in your tent as, a, um, if we all did that, I don't see that as a viable strategy. If you want to do that, that's awesome. I, I mean, have that, I understand why you do it, mm -hmm. but, um, I don't see it as a, um, as there's no ability for growth there going forward. And there's no way to further our ideas unless we are building something new, um, which we've been talking about. Now, we last two episodes we did was um, – I'd like to run this by you, actually. Last two episodes we did were about uh, sort of an agorist delivery system and the necessity – this is similar to what we were talking about just now. But the necessity for go-betweens between these different nodes, we'll say, oh, you yeah. know, um, of – mobile people uh, with the ability to deliver goods um, in between these different nodes, these second realms or, or whatever. Um, you can call it a proxy merchant, I guess, but um, but more, more we just need... A, no, because you're not going in between the, the first and second realm necessarily, mm -hmm. but we need something to cheaply deliver goods and services, uh, goods and, and that sort of thing in between these different uh, sort of homesteads and nodes and mm -hmm. freedom cells and et cetera, as we're spread out all throughout the country. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Oh yeah. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Obviously, uh, you know, as, as we've, we've been talking about and as, as Bonnie was known for, you know, mo a lot of mo mobility is big to it. Nomadism is uh, big with it. Lots of van nomads got quite a few in the network right now. 
Um, so yeah, back in uh, April of this year, I uh, um, again in Free Republic of Pasnia fashion, I um, established the Pasnia Department of Transportation, which is um, and which is for that for that purpose. Yeah, um, and it's not. I mean, it's still every a lot of this stuff is in early development and um, hasn't come together yet. But the idea is there. The idea is formed. And uh, yeah, certainly uh, um, the Pasadena Department of Transportation, its main role is to deliver, you know, uh, um, man and material, uh, you know, man and material um, all over um, to these different second realms in Pasadena. So it's uh, it's definitely an important one. Um, uh, it's yeah, definitely, definitely an important one. And uh, one I, I hope just uh, well, not hope it's I mean, it's 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 an, it's inevitable once we uh, you know, once the, the people come um and uh it just starts to happen but uh yeah you're you're, you're exactly right um i'm with you 100 percent. to to me that seems like um until we figure that one out a lot of this other stuff just can't happen well i don't want to say that but it, we can't we can't build much f f past a certain point until we figure out that sp specific mm -hmm. acts uh aspect of it until we have like our, our own distribution lines mm -hmm. um you know, a lot of other things are, are, are going to get like sort of suppressed. Like until I can send you a jar of pickles with some nomad f that's going by my homestead to yours mm -hmm. without having to go through, you know, uh, paying a, a bunch of money in shipping to go through USPS. Mm -hmm. um, until that can happen, we're really limited to what we can do. Yeah, no, you're, yeah, um, you're, you're, being you're exactly so right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I guess that uh, just to, to jump in, I'll mention um, that uh, another thing with these the, that's naturally developing is you know specialization and division of labor um, among these uh, these these uh, among these you know uh, these second realms. And um, I mean, um, we're just not really to the point yet where it's where it's come together. But yeah, you're right. I mean, once 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 there's a th there will be a demand for it at some point when um, when when things I get really when things get really get rolling, people and more people get uh, you know get to where they want to be um then yeah i think this will just be a natural and an, an, another natural evolutionary step um yeah because obviously we don't want to use the the, the 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 usps um obviously that's uh it's not that's not uh, not ideal it's not second realm it's not uh um it's not founded upon a <laughs> a foundation of uh of peace and voluntarism so um yes i'm with you yeah i just hope it uh I almost think this is something that we should have in place before we really need it. Yeah. Think so. when once we really need it, it's going to be hard to put together. So what I mean is like, oh, I'm sorry, you can't go to the store tomorrow unless you have Z papers, please. Um, you know, I might be okay. There might be some things that I'd like to trade with somebody else that I don't make myself. Um, but a lot of people are going to need be in need of something of that. Um, sort of service mm -hmm. um, and at that point it's almost like too late to, to develop it it's almost True. something you should have in place before you get to that before it becomes a necessity before you get waves of people that need it yeah that's, i've been harping on this for um, i guess that the, 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 the only struggle the only struggle is um i mean I, there's there might be a handful of them right now um, and they do they do driving jobs so, like they're traveling all the time anyway so like it, if it works out they they can do these things but um i mean it's it's just uh it's just that um yeah there's it's to to to, to for for it for the where things need to go and where they're going to line up is difficult with not as many um so-called drivers per se um so yeah no i'm i'm with you i'm with you and i it's it's just a, it's a logistical hurdle right now so i'm open to any any advice and suggestions on on how to how to expedite that uh, i'm just not not quite sure right now so, like i said i, cr I created it created this uh, or I, I put this out in april um, and actually created the Pasadena Department of Transportation Telegram channel, um, but uh, yeah, nothing has really been done with it since then. So yeah, if you've got any ideas, I'm, I'm all I'm all ears. Well, one thought I had, and it, it may not completely align with what is currently happening, but so you have a lot of people that may not be uh, of like mind, but they travel for work or something of that along those lines. They're a traveling salesman. They're a trucker. Um, so they might um, they might not agree with us on certain things per se, but they might be persuaded to, um, you know, you, you toss them a couple of bucks and they might put a couple of boxes in their front seat if they're going to a certain, uh, mm -hmm. certain direction. 
So, you know, you get a trucker that does a route to California every week. Well, I could, you know, ship him a case of pickles every time he goes and get, toss him a couple of bucks. And it's not costing him anything. You know, it's not um, it's it's not not a, not a, really an inconvenience. He's getting paid to go out there either way. So that would have to be like a, a sort of a white market, uh, white market sla uh, slash gray market uh, activity. You'd have to develop some sort of app kind of like an Uber for packages or so, something along those lines. But you could, uh, it could exist as a white market activity, but um, almost as a cover for more, you know, sort of gray market activity. And once you have that sort of um, thing going, it'd be, be easy for, um, uh, I don't know anything about the technical end of that sort of thing, but it seems to me it would be easy for sort of uh, agorist or venuans to, um, to sort of float in and out of something like that if you had yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know if it's an app or a website or whatever but they could you know you could they could use that as cover you know yeah you you have the but you have a you put together yeah the 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 white I mean have act there and there will be products and services that are completely white market obviously um not everything's illegal mm -hmm. yet um so yeah I mean uh you could certainly, um, and people are always, I mean, especially now people are looking, you know, looking for, for income and, uh, you know, some sort of a, uh, um, people do so many, deli so many del su successful deliveries, um, they build up a reputation and, um, then they can move on to the, um, you know, the second layer, um, of that where there are, you know, more, I guess, maybe illicit or possibly illicit things. Um, not that they would need to know anything. It's about the, anything that's in the packages. Um, well, maybe they do, maybe that's between them and the, the person that, that they're using, but, um, yeah, anyway, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Just, that's the first thought that, um, really this, the, my, the main, soul uh not that my soul reason but my primary reason is people want my pickles and it's too expensive to ship them that's the like the whole reason right. i'm so fired up about this uh -huh. but um i'm i'm kidding but that that's what was my first thought when um when i when i first was like man we need like an app or something like an uber for fucking agorist package delivery where you or where you can just say I, I need something from this place, you know, um, and, there, and you match it up with a trucker that's already going out there or a traveling salesman or whatever the heck, and you toss them a few bucks. And it, it just seems like it would be an easy way to at least get something started. And it should, I mean, it should be, um, it should be pretty, just a pretty automated process, um, you would think. And there's probably already yes. algorithms out there that would do that, so that, the search algorithms that would already do that, I presume. Um, but... Yeah. yeah, I mean, so yeah, I'll, I'll release this on the Vani podcast feed too. But yeah, I mean, if there's any anyone out there who wants to work on this or on your your audience too, I mean, that's uh, I th I'm with you. It's a, it's a it's an important it's an important step. It's an important step, and I think that might be a, a possible yeah. possible launching route. Yeah, I agree. Well, um, Penguin, you got anything else? I gotta get rocking and rolling, but yeah, me too. But I did want to say, um, and one thing that you—it's not even non-competitive, but that you can't ship is people yourself. And True. if you want to, I think that can be just as useful. Mm, yeah. Um, and this has been mentioned before, getting getting a, a ride from city to city, because once you once you start doing that, your your ride sharing bill can go up quite a bit. I mean, that can that can get kind of uh, expensive on those long distance rides, um, people do it. I, I've definitely seen it done, but you could definitely uh, m use the kind of service you're describing. Like, and um, and I just want to point out, and I'm going to mention it, that that, that was one of the uh, main things that uh, apparently was uh, kind of a big deal, kind of in demand back in the uh, 70s when um, uh, Carl Hess was talking about community technology, getting rides in and out of town. Um, you know, that was, that was a way they used co the community, uh, bulletin boards and everything. So, yeah, I mean, definitely getting a ride from, uh, city to city, state to state, um, not having to go through, uh, you know, at the worst Greyhound, which you might not even, it's, it's, it's buses aren't really great in this country. Trains really aren't an option. Then you, then you got, uh, flying. A lot of people don't want to fly for whatever reason, or, uh, in a lot of places they, there aren't, uh, direct flights. Too so yeah no I, I think that'd be that'd be great and you should be able to ship you'd be able to have uh, passengers packages switch back and forth do, do some of do some of each um, just take a passenger on a route you're already doing for business I think it'd be a great idea 
Yeah, that's mm-hmm. something I think about less. I think it would be slightly less common, but it might almost be more important. So say one of us uh, is feeling a little bit of heat. It might not be, as, you know, as I'm talking about as state progresses, gets progressively worse as it is uh, yeah. in, in certain regards. Um, if, you know, somebody we know is feeling a little heat, it might not be, um, and we've talked about this on other episodes, but it might not be a bad idea to have um, a network of people that or that can get you a ride and get you gone fast um, and, and into hiding. Or maybe you just need a ride across the country either way. But both of these things would be very, very important if the, such a situation arose. Um so I think that's absolutely – it's something I think about less, but I think that's possibly even more important. Um, go ahead. Yeah. All right. Well, if that's – Yep. If that's what, other what you got. Yeah, no, I, I, that's it for me. Anybody well, I, I think we had a really uh, fruitful discussion. I mean, yeah, we're, we're kind of laying out a little bit of a vision here. And I think um, – you know, as you have talked to people that are in that kind in the homestead lifestyle and in the counter economy, um, you definitely see we, we do get feedback. There is a demand for that kind of service, and I think we have to we have to think forward because so you look at maybe some of the previous writings from previous decades. Yeah, they uh, a lot of the same dynamics come into play, but they're in a different setting and a different um, level of. And I always go back to this technology, and. You, you know, they can only predict so much. So I think that we are uniquely situated to um, really impact our relations to uh, production and uh, in, uh, communications, obviously, the backbone of this. And that, that work's really been done with cryptography and and, and everything. But um, and then there's just crypto. But in terms of our relation to production and to um the state in general transportation that's an amazing one to try to do something with because that's always such a huge vulnerability i think yeah i think we uh i think we break some pretty good ground talking about solutions so shane uh, thank you for coming on i uh, really appreciate your insights on a lot of things i'm going to look into the mushroom thing i think that's uh le- learn something just in the first like couple couple minutes of the podcast that was great yeah yeah right on well as yeah, always shane, I it's been good having you on i think we yeah, this is a really good one, man. I, I think we, uh, I think we, it was pretty informative, and uh, it was an overall good conversation. And it, um, hopefully, we spark some um, some thoughts in people's heads about uh, you know some of the things we've talked about, and uh, kind of get the ball rolling on some of these things. But uh, thanks for having on. Hey, plug uh, your stuff. Whatever you f- I forgot to mention in the beginning of the the, the podcast there. Sure. So I guess the websites uh, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. The the first thing I'll or the only real the real important thing is that uh, is Paznia dot com. Uh, if you want to join the you know the second second realm Paznia network, I just put out uh, Paznia dot com forward slash join um, today. Um, there's a forum for people who want to um, who want to uh, you know open up their their homestead. Um, or you know their location to to vetted uh, self liberators. Um, so if you want to to check that out, if you've got uh, if you've got a place you want to make a node on the Second Realm Network, like we're doing here with Veritas, um, then uh, you can go there and uh, and check that out. Um, now I also um, there um, there uh, and then just for for general for general stuff, I definitely get on the email list uh, there at Paznia dot com. Um, uh, is I, I do want to have um, I'm going to put put together a similar form at some point whenever I have time. But for for just individuals who want to get involved, whether it's for seed exchange or for um, you know potentially driving for the Paznia Department of Transportation or whatever that whatever they want to do to get involved, um, whatever their interests are, um, then uh, we want we want to make sure people people can you know. Um, can, can join as long as they're vetted and all. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Pasnia.com for everything, uh, the free public, what we're doing there. And uh, Vonnypodcast.com for um, more, I guess, more content like this. There's a lot of uh, a lot of episodes where we, we go deep into strategy just like we did in this conversation. It's one of my favorite things to do. And, uh, uh, yeah, I guess that's uh, with that. Thanks again, guys. I, I look forward to the next conversation. All right. Yeah, too, Thank man. you. Take care, Thanks, guys. Everybody. Our strategy for liberty is the creation of a culture of liberty, a society that occupies its own protected space and implements independent systems of cooperation. We need to create a second realm.